and welcome to Forensic Science, Education and Employment. My name is Ken Williams and I will be your presenter this evening. Before we get started, I would like to begin with a couple housekeeping rules for you. Well, first of all, there is a little disclaimer I am to read. Our software and Adobe Flash have developed a bug on some sy systems. If you are having trouble hearing our presentation, just click hide video and show video to refresh. The second thing, questions. If you have questions at any point throughout the presentation, feel free to type them in. I can see them from where I am situated and I may answer many of the questions throughout the presentation or I may wait until the end. So if I don't get to your question right away, don't worry, we may by the end of the session. So let's begin. During this hour-long session, we are going to take a look at background, education, employment, and the ever-popular CSI effect. With the background, I'll begin with a little bit about my background, and then we will take a look into the background for forensic science. With education, we will talk about some of the classes that are required in order to begin a career in forensic science. Once we finish there, we will start with employment. Talk about some of the different jobs that you may be able to get and some of the agencies that you may be able to work with. And we will finish with the CSI effect. My background. I like to start here because oftentimes when I give a presentation, many people will ask, well, what exactly well, well, what classes did you take in order to get a career in forensic science? I have a BS in chemistry, and I earned that at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I have a master's degree in forensic science, which I obtained at the University of New Haven in Connecticut. And I also have my JD degree from the Rutgers University School of Law in Camden. I decided to go back to school once I began my career because I wanted to get a degree which will enable me to teach more classes as I got a little older and advanced in the field. My professional background. I am currently employed by the New Jersey State Police Office of Forensic Sciences. I am the assistant lab director for one of our satellite labs. I have training in drug chemistry, general toxicology, and forensic serology. My first actual job in the field was, believe it or not, as a morgue attendant where, ironically, I worked the graveyard shift. I did that while working as a toxicologist in a small private tox lab. And we'll talk a little bit more about private laboratories as the presentation goes on, because some of you, if you really want a job in this field, may start in private laboratories. Sometimes it's easier to start there than with an agency such as the one I work, a state agency or a federal government agency, because sometimes their requirements are a little bit tougher. Forensic science. What exactly is forensic science? And I gave you a clue here on the slides. You see a microscope and you see some images that may remind you of our legal system. So with that in mind, forensic science, the application of science to matters of the law. Now, for 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 a forensic scientist. That's a little bit tougher. A forensic scientist is an individual that analyzes physical evidence. And that physical evidence is anything that may be recovered from any type of crime that may have occurred. A forensic scientist may assist in proving the existence of a crime or making a connection to a crime. And a forensic scientist will provide information and expert opinion to investigators, attorneys, judges, and also juries. But above all else, a forensic scientist is one that works for the truth. And that's very important to think about here. Because oftentimes people will, people will think that a forensic scientist works for the prosecution or the defense. We can work for either of those, but more importantly, we want to uncover the truth. Now, physical evidence. Physical evidence is any object 
that can establish that a crime has been committed. And that physical evidence can provide links between the suspects, the victims, and possibly the scenes. And now, when we take a look at that link or those links that can be provided, we have to start with low cards exchange principle. With the low cards exchange principle, whenever two objects come into contact with each other, there is always an exchange of material. And the way that exchange takes place, it occurs between the victim and the scene, the victim and the suspect, the scene and the suspect, or the scene and the victim. A little three-way triangle there. That is the basis for us being able to do what we do in the laboratories and in the forensic science field. Because without that exchange of material, there is no way for us to detect the evidence that is necessary in order to establish a crime or establish that a crime has been committed. Now, we shall begin to take a look at the education. Before we get started here, we have to make a key distinction, and that is criminal justice versus forensic science. Criminal justice may lead you to a career on the non-laboratory side of law enforcement. And those can be police officers, investigators, or anyone without the science background necessary to work in, in a laboratory. But forensic science, a science-based forensic science program, will allow you to work inside an actual laboratory. But the key here, with a science-based forensic science program, you can obtain a degree in a forensic science or in a natural science, and they both work equally as well. A degree in forensic science. Those programs are designed to provide students with the knowledge to help you apply the scientific method to criminal investigations. A degree in forensic science can lead you to a career in a forensic science laboratory, an analytical laboratory, or possibly teach forensic science at the high school or even middle school level now, as well as college. But a degree in a natural or a hard science, as some may call it, that degree helps you apply the scientific methods to natural events. And a hard science would be any of the sciences such as biology, chemistry, physics, molecular biology, or genetics. And these are some of the careers or some of the fields that you may want to concentrate on with the hard sciences. With education, it's important to review the course of study. If you would like to work in a laboratory, you want to make sure your cor course of study has at least 24 credits in either chemistry or biology. Some jobs may actually require a degree in a forensic science or a science or an equivalent, and they may look for that title, say a BS in chemistry or a BS in biology or a BS in forensic science. If you would like to become a DNA analyst, there are cl courses that you really have to have in order to obtain that job, such as molecular biology, genetics, statistics, and biochemistry. Without those four courses, you will be unable to work as a DNA analyst. Now, let's consider undergraduate versus graduate school studies. I'm often asked, is it necessary to obtain a graduate degree? Well, that's really a personal preference. For me, I decided to get my graduate degree because I want, wanted to be able to teach at a higher level. As far as obtaining your graduate degree before you start your career or after you start your career, that's something you may want to look into because there are a couple of things that come into play. One. If you obtain a job with an agency, they may pay for your education. They may allow you to go back to school during work time and reimburse your tuition. However, sometimes obtaining a graduate degree before you start your career may help you actually get your foot into the door. For instance, where I work in New Jersey, if you do not have a master's degree, you need a bachelor's degree in one of the sciences, forensic science, or natural or hard science, and two years of experience. 
if you have a graduate degree, you can substitute, substitute your degree for one year of experience. So with a master's degree, you can enter the field with a master's degree and one year of experience. Now, how do you obtain that experience? That is an interesting question because it's really one of those things. Consider the chicken or the egg concept. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, in order to get a job in a laboratory, they often require that you have experience. Well, if you're unable to get a job, how will you get that experience? And that's where the private labs come into play. Oftentimes, you may need to start with a private lab laboratory because their requirements are not as stringent. You may be able to work in a private lab laboratory with a graduate or an undergraduate degree with little to no experience at all. That's how I entered the field. I started in a private lab, and after I obtained my year of experience, I was able to get a job with a state agency. When considering education, we can look at many different opportunities or many different institutions. But there's something I'd like to bring to your attention, and that is an organization called PPAC, the Forensic Science Education Programs Accreditation Commission. This is an accrediting body that accredits university programs at both the graduate and undergraduate level. This is a voluntary process. But what the agency does, or the organization, it promotes academic quality of forensic science educational programs in the United States. It recognizes and distinguishes high quality undergraduate and graduate forensic science programs. So this is something to think about as we take a look at the next slide. What's the benefit to students? Well, if you attend a university that is PPAC accredited, you know you're getting a quality education. There are many forensic science programs out there today. When I started many years ago, there were only a handful of universities that offered a graduate degree in forensic science. Because of the boom in the field, there are so many universities out there now that you can obtain a degree in forensic science from. And some of those universities are online opportunities. Well, the benefit of PPAC to students, you know you're going to get a quality education from a university that has been scrutinized by this, by this accrediting body. They will go in and take a look at the instructors. They will make sure the coursework is relevant to the field of forensic science, as well as the requirements that you need in order to obtain a job in the field. PPAC has, began, has begun accrediting many different universities and is now being looked at as a gold standard. It's not a requirement to get a job in the field that you graduate from a PPAC accredited college, but as more and more students enter the field from PPAC accredited colleges, many employers will begin to look at where the student graduated from and those that graduate from a PPAC accredited college may have an upper hand. And in this field, since it is so popular, any hand that you can get, any upper hand that you can get, is one that you should appreciate. For a complete listing of accredited undergraduate and graduate programs, you can visit the website listed here. And again, there are many universities that are accredited at this time. And so by going to that website, you can get a listing of all of the universities that have obtained their accreditation. And remember, by going to a PPAC accredited college, you know you're getting a quality education. And I can honestly add that I was excited when I took a look at the accredited universities. Both of the universities that I graduated from, both undergrad and graduate, are PPAC accredited universities. When I graduated, PPAC was not around or had not accredited many universities, but since graduation they have obtained their accreditation. As a student, something you may want to take a look at would be ways in order to get involved in the field. The organizations listed on this slide 
have student member opportunities where you can join the organization, attend the meetings, attend their seminars, and network with people or individuals in the field of forensic science. That's a wonderful opportunity for students. I remember going to organizations or going to meetings as a student and talking to some of the people that are currently in the field and just getting advice. In a sense, you can that way be mentored by someone in the field. By making those connections and networking with others, you're able to find out exactly what it takes in order to do what it is you may dream of doing someday. Some of the organizations listed, such as the California Association of Criminalists and the New Jersey Association of Forensic Scientists, they are more localized, say California or New Jersey. But some of the regional societies, like the Mid-Atlantic Association of Forensic Scientists, the Northeastern Association of Forensic Scientists, they all have regional meetings, and those meetings could span the two to three days. That would be a wonderful opportunity to network as a student. They also have opportunities for students to present. If you're doing research in school, you can attend some of these meetings, present your papers, present some of the research that you may have done under, under a professor. That is a great way to get your name out there. To impress someone, say a lab director, that may be looking for another analyst. So don't, underest don't underestimate those opportunities. Get involved at the regional level. Now, if you're looking for something a bit larger, there's also an organization at the national level, and that is the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, AAFS. It is an organization that was founded in 1948 and it has over 6,200 members. It represents all 50 United States, Canada, and 66 other countries worldwide. You can see the website listed below, www.aafs.org. AAFS is a professional society dedicated to the application of science to the law. With over 6,200 members and 11 sections, there are many opportunities to network with others in this very multidisciplinary organization. You can take a look at the sections that the AAFS has. Criminalistics, Digital and Multimedia Sciences, Engineering Sciences, there's a general section, a jurisprudence section, jurisprudence being the legal section. In order to be a member of that, that section, you have to have a law degree or be in the process of obtaining a law degree. Odontology, which deals with dentistry. The path bio section, medical examiners, pathologists, physicians, physical anthropology. Those are those that work with bone for a living. They may do facial reconstructions, and they may go to digs, find bones, determine if it's human, determine whether or not it's a male or a female, and if it's an animal. Psychiatry and behavioral science, question documents, and toxicology. Now, if we use employment or use the AAFS as a guide for determining employment, we can see some of the different types of careers that may have an involvement with forensic science. Medical examiners, forensic scientists, criminalists, toxicologists, attorneys, nurses, dentists, forensic entomologists. That's a new up and coming field where a lot of the analysts will work with bugs for a living. Physical anthropologists, document examiners, physicists, digital evidence experts, engineers, crime scene investigators, educators, attorneys, and psychiatrists. But if we turn our attention back to forensic science, as we will discuss it for the remainder of this presentation, some of the careers that you may be able to t obtain in forensic science would be as a criminalist. And a criminalist is an analyst that works with physical evidence, very similar to a forensic scientist. It is just a title. 
and they're fairly interchangeable. Technicians, toxicologists. Toxicologists work with bodily fluids. Drug chemists work in the drug chemistry unit. DNA analysts, crime scene investigators, trace evidence examiners. There are also firearm examiners, fire debris examiners, document examiners, and the list goes on. And where might you work if you were to obtain a job in forensic science? You may be able to work with a federal agency, the FBI, the Drug Enforcement Agency, ATF, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and the USPS. Believe it or not, the United States Postal Service has a forensic laboratory. You may work with a local police department. You could also obtain a job with a city, county, or state agency. You can work in a medical examiner's office. Private laboratories, which I discussed a little bit earlier, you can also work in a research facility. And once you've gotten a little experience under your belt, you may be able to work for yourself as a consultant. That way you really get to determine your own hours. And now for the salary. That's a question that I ask quite often. If you visit the website I have listed here, payscale.com, this was last updated April 24th of this year, you can see some of the salary ranges for the careers that we shall focus on. Forensic scientists, the range of their salary across the nation, 30, 36000 to roughly $76,000 with a median salary of $49,000. A forensic science technician, their salary range $25,000 to roughly $61,000, a median range of $38,000. And a criminalist, their range $18,000 to roughly $85,000 with a median range of $50,000. The bottom line, the median salary for a forensic scientist is roughly $49,000. Considering the fact that most forensic scientists work a 40-hour work week, we can do the math to determine the hourly wage. With a 52, with 52 weeks a year, and with that median salary of $49,000, that translates into roughly $23.95 an hour excluding holidays and benefit time. Benefit time being sick time that you may be given, vacation time, and again, holidays. Again, $23 an hour, or just say 24. The current federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour right now. With a career in forensic science, you're not going to get rich but you will have the benefit of having a very rewarding career. And you can see that even with the median salary for forensic scientists, it's over three times the actual federal minimum wage per hour. So it is a very good career, but again, it is not an extremely lucrative career. You may not get rich, but you will have a very rewarding job. I go to work each and every day knowing that I am providing a service to my community. I get to work on cases that may help keep bad people off of the street, but I'm also doing a service to those that may have been wrongly accused of committing a crime. By the work that we do, again, we keep bad people off the street and allow the good people to remain on the street. Now, the CSI effects. All of the television shows that are out there now have really created this boom that we have witnessed in the field of forensic science. Because of the TV shows, many have an interest in forensic science. Many want to do exactly what they see on television. They think we all work in a laboratory wearing high heel stilettos or wearing nice 
or custom-made suits, that we drive fancy cars, that we do many of the things that they see on TV. But to that I say, yeah right. This is what we wear for the most part. In the laboratory, we're not wearing the fancy high heel shoes, especially me. Hopefully that's something my coworkers will never experience. But we have to wear personal pr protective equipment. And that equipment includes lab coats, face masks, could be hair nets. We all wear hair, hair nets depending on the type of evidence we're, we work with. Even I will occasionally wear a hair net. We wear the goggles and gloves. But the effects of the CSI effect. Television often gives the impression that the forensic scientist is in charge of the entire case. They give the impression that the forensic science scientist actually goes to the crime scene, will process the scene, conduct the forensic analysis back at the lab, develop and interview suspects, and possibly make the arrest. Well, that is not the case. Forensic scientists are often stationed back in the laboratory. Every now and then we will go out to a crime scene. I've been working with the state police now for 13 years, and I may have gone to five or six crime scenes in the time that I've been there. It is not often that we will go out to a crime scene. And whether or not you go out to crime scenes at all really depends on the jurisdiction that you work. Where I work, Crime scenes are often worked by sworn officers, those that carry a weapon. Again, that's something else most forensic scientists will not do, will not carry a weapon. Not because they don't want to, but it's not something that's part of our job. Some jurisdictions will have sworn officers in the forensic science laboratory, but those are officers that will have a science background, so they are qualified to work in the laboratory. If you're not one that's employed in one of those jurisdictions, you will work in the lab for the most part. You may go out to crime scenes, but you're definitely not going to be the one to interview suspects. When we go out to crime scenes, we are there to process the scene in order to obtain the evidence and take it back to the laboratory for subsequent analysis. And we definitely will not make the arrest. On the TV shows, if the forensic scientists aren't the ones making the arrest, they're more than likely riding along with the officers to go and make the arrest as they identify the suspect that they may have established from working the evidence back at the laboratory. Again, that's not something we're going to do. We're stationed in the laboratory and we process the evidence as it comes in to us. As forensic scientists or analysts working in the field of forensic science, we are here to assist law enforcement. What we do is help put pieces of the puzzle together. As the evidence comes in, we will process it. We can help establish a link, again, between the scene and the victim, the victim and the scene, the victim and the suspect. Remember the triangle we talked about earlier with the low cards exchange principle. By processing that evidence, we may give investigative leads to the police officers, we may also help establish a crime that the prosecutors can use to obtain a conviction, but we may also help exonerate a defendant or a suspect that's been charged with the crime. Again, we don't work for either the prosecution or the defense. We work to obtain the truth. Another thing you may see on the television shows, you may see nice fancy cars like the one pictured here. The nice shiny rims, the really sleek exterior, the really roomy interior. In all actuality, these are the vehicles that we drive, or at least with my agency. Nice little sedan where if you're going to court, or we also have a van where if we're going to a crime scene and we need to load equipment that we need to take to the crime scene in order to process the scene. We could also use the van for training purposes when we're transporting a number of analysts to other sites for training or 
to go to court. But I'll stop there to talk about court just a little bit because we do provide testimony. As forensic scientists, we will provide testimony based on the reports that we issue. We will go to court, give the testimony, again, based on the report, and do our part to help the justice system. When thinking about the CSI shows, we have to talk about the technology. That's the question that I'm often asked. Whether or not the technology that is, show, that is shown on the CSIs or the NCISs or many of the other CSI type shows out there now, is the technology true and accurate? Well, actually, it is. The technology is the one thing that translates into our job or into the career that I have now. I'll just show you a couple of examples. Here's a compound microscope, and this is being used by one of the analysts or one of my coworkers. The compound microscope is a really neat tool, a very neat instrument. It has two stages where you can place an object, one object on each of the stages, and it allows you to compare what you see under the field of view of the microscope. If you take a look at the upper left hand corner, you'll see the computer screen there. You really can't see it very well in this image, but the next slide you will be able to do so. But the image is projected onto the computer screen and the analyst is able to take a closer look at that screen or can have someone else look at it. So an observer is able to view exactly what the analyst sees when using the microscope. Here's a better picture. A different compound microscope, but you really can see a good view of the monitor itself. And what's being looked at here would be a red fiber. There could be a known fiber placed on one stage of the microscope and an unknown fiber placed on the other stage of the microscope. And what the analyst is able to do is to adjust the field of view just enough to where the screens will match up. And you can actually see the line going down the middle of the monitor. And so that analyst is actually able to compare one field of view with another field of view. And it makes it really easy to make comparisons using this type of technology. When focusing while well, continuing on with the microscopes, take a look at this. The left hand corner, we have an image of a car that may have been involved in a hit and run, or it could have been an accident where a car backed into a, someone riding a bicycle, but there's a paint transfer that's on the bumper. By taking a sample of that paint transfer, again, the low card exchange principle, whenever two objects come into contact with one another, there is an exchange of material. We can take a section of that paint and look at it under, mic under the microscope. By viewing it under the microscope, you're able to take a look at the minute details of that paint chip. And again, you can make a comparison once you have a known vehicle that you want to compare it to and determine whether or not that paint chip or that paint transfer was taken from another vehicle or from the bike in question. When visualizing stains, we do have some of the technology that you may see on television that will enable you to see stains that you can't ordinarily see with the naked eye. This is one of our examples, an alternate light source or the ALS. By using the ALS with the correct lenses, you can visualize stains to make it possible to do further testing. Take a look at the image that is shown in the bottom right corner. That is a stain that has been visualized using the ALS. And imagine how that can help you in the laboratory if you're examining a large item, say a bedspread or a comforter off of a bed. 
and you really need to take a look at that entire item to see if you can find a stain. By using the alternate light source, we are able to visualize those stains that may be present on that item and then we can subject it to further testing. We have many other types of instrumentation that we can use. One of the main workhorses in a forensic laboratory is the gas chromatograph coupled with a mass spectrometer or a GCMS. Many of the different disciplines in forensic science take advantage of the useful, usefulness of the GCMS, drug chemistry, trace evidence, toxicology, fire debris analysis. All of those disciplines or units are able to use the GCMS to help make confirmations. And by making a confirmation, we are able to definitively say whether or not an item is what we say it to be. So when thinking about the technology, in all actuality, the shows may have its many actors, its many actresses that wear the nice trotter suits, the high heel stilettos, drive the fancy cars, and look quite handsome, I might add. But in forensic science, the technology is the true star. The, the technology enables us to do our job, not only accurately, but also rather efficiently. The TV shows will give the impression that a crime can be solved in a matter of minutes, but that's not always the case. Every now and then, evidence will come in that we may be able to process quickly, depending on the type of case, or which unit it came into and the evidence that needs to be examined. For the most part, if you're thinking about a drug case or a case that came into the drug chemistry unit, if you're analyzing, say, a marijuana sample, we may be able to get your results within an hour or so. If it's a cocaine sample or heroin sample or one of the other controlled dangerous substances that may be submitted to the laboratory, we could get you a result within a day because once we do the presumptive testing, it has to be confirmed and that takes a while. But when you consider some of the other units, like say DNA, it may take weeks to obtain results. Fire debris analysis could take that same amount of time, weeks. But because of the number of cases that are submitted to, to the laboratory, we are backlogged where we have cases that are waiting to be processed. Trace cases could take months to even years because of the complexity. You could be working on a trash bag trying to identify a trash bag or match the trash bag up with a batch of trash, trash bags that may have been obtained from the suspect's house. You could be working a fiber case, could be working a hair analysis case. Those cases take a lot of time because of the instrumentation involved. And when dealing with fibers and hair, it's a lot of microscope work. So picking through all of the fibers, all of the hairs that may be submitted to the laboratory for analysis in order to make an identification, that takes time. Consider a glass case that may be submitted to the laboratory. If that glass case is submitted fractured or in pieces, someone has to put that glass, piece it back together. Again, that takes time. We're just not able to get results as quickly as they do on television, but we are able to get results. We just have to be patient, and that is something we often struggle with when talking to the law enforcement agencies when they expect their results back in minutes, similar to what they see on television. The technology does aid us quite a bit, but it has not advanced to the point where we can get results within a matter of minutes, and definitely not within 60 minutes, including commercial time. Well, if there are any questions, I will be happy to entertain those now for you. Okay. What's my typical day like? My day is a little bit different now because I'm no longer on the bench. 
But when I was on the bench, my day was very similar to going to work, being given a case by my supervisor, and processing that case. When I was in the drug unit, I could process a number of cases in a day. My supervisor may have assigned, say, a batch of 20 cases. Depending on the complexity of the case, I could process those cases in that day and possibly get new cases before I left at the end of the day. When I worked in the toxicology unit, assigning cases was a little bit different because then I was given cases in batches where I may have been given 20 samples or so to extract. And by extract, that's to take the sample as submitted and to get it into a usable form where I can place it on the instrumentation in order to obtain the results that we need in order to issue a report. And by working on those cases in batches, it allowed us to efficiently process a number of cases. But again, that took time. We weren't able to process a case in a single day and obtain results that same day because there are screening tests that you have to perform and then there are confirmatory tests that you have to complete as well. So to process a batch of cases could take anywhere from a week to two to even three weeks depending on the number of, number of extractions that you had to do. What is one of the more rewarding things about my job? Again, I'll go back to the salary. It is not a very lucrative career. However, it is a very good living. If you remember the salary and the median salary for forensic science, scientists being roughly forty-nine to $50,000. You're not going to get rich, but the reward for me is knowing that I go to work each and every day and I am providing a service my community and also get to do some very neat things along the way just this week I gave a lecture to a second grade class for the second graders at my son's elementary school and one of the neatest things they thought about the entire presentation was the fact that I was able to tell them that maggots eat 24 hours a day because their mouth parts are located on one end and their breathing parts are located on the other end and that enabled them or the maggots to just eat non-stop well imagine the looks on the kids faces when they heard that that was probably the most important thing they heard from that entire 30 minute presentation and while the other questions come up I just want to take a moment to show you if you can take a look at this neat little shirt that my son gave me for Christmas one year. CSI, can't stand idiots. This is one of my favorite shirts to wear on the weekend as I'm going around to my different son's sporting events and when I'm able to wear that shirt, I do get a lot of comments on that. CSI, can't stand idiots. But we know it to mean crime scene investigation. question is coming up now. Why did I get my law degree? Again, as I mentioned earlier, I decided to go to school to get my law degree in order to teach forensic science at both the graduate level and also in law schools. I currently am an adjunct professor for a law school where I teach forensic science seminar and with the background in forensic science and the law degree I just thought I would be better able and have more opportunities to do that well it seems as though our questions have ended so I really hope you enjoyed the session and I hope you learned a little bit more about forensic science I know I really didn't get into the details of forensic science, but I really wanted to focus on the education and the employment opportunities. Again, I'd like to reiterate some of the things I mentioned earlier, because I do talk to many students from time to time, and one of the biggest questions they will ask is forensic science, 
versus, say, a hard or natural science. Be careful with the forensic science programs. If you would like to work in a laboratory, again, make sure you obtain either a science-based forensic science degree or obtain a degree in a natural science, that being chemistry, biology, genetics, biochemistry. Get a degree in one of those fields. Some universities will offer forensic science programs that are based in the criminal justice department, even some of the online programs. There's nothing wrong with those programs. However, if you would like to work in a laboratory, you may not obtain the science background that you need in order to obtain a job in the lab. Also, many of the online programs, they are unable to offer the science portion, and so it may truly be a criminal justice-based forensic science program. If that is the area that you would like to go into, that would be a great idea for you. Because with that non-science-based forensic science program, it will enable you to work in the non-laboratory side of law enforcement. Again, police officers, investigators, even crime scene investigators. There are many crime scene investigators that do not have the science background. They have the training, but they are able to go and process scenes due to the training that they have received. However, there are some crime scene inve investigators that do have the science background, and depending on the jurisdiction that you live or that you choose to work, you may be able to get a job as a crime scene investigator with a non-science degree. It really depends on the jurisdiction. I wish you the best of luck, and if you happen to continue to stick with forensic science, you'll see that it is a very rewarding career. There's a lot to learn, and the field itself is ever-changing. Good luck.